Thank you, uh, Pastor Fernando. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be uh, speaking to you guys today. So uh, my wife actually is not here to uh, give me hand signals, you know, like she's at a conference. Anyway, I'm thankful for my wife. She gave me feedback on my sermon that helped me, so uh, I was talking to her about it. Anyway, and I'll probably get more feedback from her later after she hears the podcast. So let's pray. So Father God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your rain. I thank you for your river, and I thank you for your move. God, help us to know your heart. God, help us to know the heart from which you speak. God, give us ears to hear. God, help me as I speak this morning. Bless every person here in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of my sermon today is The Prodigal Father. If you want, you can write that down. The Prodigal Father. Okay. And what I really want to talk to you about is the love of God. That the unselfish, generous kindness and care that flow from our Father in heaven down to us. Now, uh, I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to make a statement. God is unselfish. God is unselfish. Do you agree with that? Amen. I don't think there's anybody in this room that would disagree with that. And we believe that God is good and we believe that God is loving. But you know, here's the thing. We know that we were made in the image of God. And sometimes, knowing that we were made in the image of God, we see traces of God's nature in humankind. We see how a mother protects her children. And we think, God, like, God is like that. He covers us with his feathers. Or we see how a man lays his life down for his friend. And we say, Jesus was like that. He laid down his life. But then there are other times where we realize men are, men can be, people can be selfish, people can be unkind. And if we're not careful, we will ascribe those same traits to the Father in heaven. We'll say, well, God must be like this. God, God must be like people who have mistreated me. God must, you know, be in some way not good, not good as I thought he was. The problem is that that's incorrect. That's, that's, how we're not made in the image, or rather God is not made in our image, let's say that. And uh, the truth is, we're not here to meet God's needs. God is the one that meets our needs. He, he is a generous, he's a, a rich and generous father. So uh, that said, I want to say that I love parables. I love analogies and I love comparisons. I love to use them when working with kids or youth or anybody to try to illustrate truths. And, you know, you can find parables in the Old Testament. We don't usually think of that. Who we really think of is Jesus and him giving all those parables in the Gospels, trying to tell us what is the kingdom of heaven like? You know, what is the Father like? What, what is truth like? So today I plan to talk about, as you might guess, the, the parable of the prodigal son. But also, I hope you don't mind, I've made up a few parables or a few little illustrations, some analogies of my own. Actually, I have six of them, and then I have one joke, okay? I have six parables and a joke. They're short, don't worry, okay? So I want to share them with you, and uh, I hope that it helps us understand something about, about the love of the Father. So here goes, here's parable number one. This is the doctor and the patient, the doctor and the patient. Once upon a time, there was a doctor, or there was a man who was sick with pretty, pretty serious illness. And so he goes to the doctor, and the doctor examines him. He says, look, sir, Mr. Smith, or whatever. He says, Mr. Smith, I want you to do three things. He says, you need to, A, you need to improve your diet. You've got to, you've got to eat less fat and sugar, you've got to, and uh, you've got to eat more veggies. He says, number two, I want you to exercise. You need to walk or do something at least 30 minutes a day. And number three, I'm giving you some prescription medication and you need to take it every day. So the man thanks him and he leaves and six weeks pass and he comes back. The man comes back six weeks later and he says, he says, doctor, I'm sorry because, because he's even in even worse condition than he was before. He says, doctor, I'm really sorry. He says, I didn't change my diet. I tried, but then I saw a box of Twinkies. He said, I didn't exercise. I mean, I tried, but on the second day, it was just too much. And he said, and actually, I've been so busy, I haven't even made it to Walgreens to, to fill that prescription you gave me. And he says, doctor, I really respect you, and I appreciate what you do for me and your expertise, but, but I didn't do this stuff. Would you please forgive me, doctor? And the doctor says, look, Mr. Smith, 
I hate to see you sick. It really does pain me to see you sick. But do you realize that all that stuff I told you to do was for your benefit, not for mine? That's the end of parable number one. Listen to this. Like going to the doctor, like when a patient goes to the doctor, we go to the Lord and we have needs. We have needs for a relationship. We need forgiveness. We need a financial miracle. We need grace to get, it, to get through the day. We need all this stuff. And God, he answers our prayers. He, he helps us. He gives us, you know, medicine, if you will. He gives us supplies. But, you know, he also has some, some doctor's orders. He also has some advice for us. He's not just giving answers, he's also giving advice. And what we call these doctor's orders in Christianese is the will of God. It's the commandments of the Lord. And, and I think that uh, probably everybody here is interested in finding out and doing the will of God. If not, you wouldn't be here this morning. What I want to say today is that, that God's rules and his commands, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, of course, get into legalism or whatever or talk about the Ten Commandments, but just in general, the will of God for your life, what he says in, in his word, these commands are not arbitrary and capricious, okay? He didn't just make them up on a whim, you know, back before the beginning of the earth. He didn't say, hmm, I think tithing is good and lying is bad, and uh, let's see, stealing is bad, but praying is good. That'll be good. He, I don't believe he did that because his will and his commands reflect who he is. They reflect his goodness. And anything that's bad goes against the nature of the Father. It's not just that, you know, Mike, Mike make, makes right and he gets to decide. So the manufacturer knows what's best or knows how best to use the product. The creator knows how creation is supposed to function and so he gave us guidelines in accordance with that. See, when God gives us commands, when he makes his will known to us, he doesn't really do it for his benefit. He does it for our benefit. Okay? See, do you know what the Bible says? And this is one of my favorite verses. In Psalm 50, 12, it says, he says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. The Lord the Lord does not look to us to meet his needs. He's not a needy God. He, he's an abundantly rich and generous father. He, but he, nonetheless, he delights in his creation. He delights in our praises. He delights to see us prosper. I believe like a good father, he loves to see his children happy. And so when he gives us these commandments, when he gives us these commandments, I believe he's really thinking of you and me. He's really thinking, he's really looking out for us. Because see, God is good. God is good. And what I, how I mean that is, have you ever asked somebody if they want a Coke or they want something to eat and they say, no, I'm good. God is good. Okay, God is good. He's at peace. He's well supplied for, but he loves you. Listen to this parable, this parable number two. This is called Playing in the Woods. Once upon a time, there was a man who bought a home for his family on a large piece of land out in the country. And one day, his little boy, he was eager to go out to play. He says, Daddy, can I go out to play? He says, yes. But listen, here's the rules. He says, he says, you can go play in the pasture. There's a big, wide open field. You can run around out there. You can also, uh, I gotta look at my notes to see what he can do. Oh, you can go to the orchard. There's an orchard. And you can climb the trees in the orchard. But when you go through the woody area, stay on the path and don't wander into the woods. And also there's a rocky hill. Don't go play over there. You got it, son? He's like, got it, dad. So he goes out and he plays for a long time. And he climbs trees in the orchard and he runs around in the pasture. And he goes up and down the path. And then later he's like, you know what? I don't know why my dad told me not to go in the woods and climb on the rocks. And so he starts climbing on rocks and playing in the woods. And so wouldn't you know it, by the end of the day, he comes home. And he says, sorry, he doesn't say, he's got a big goose egg, got a big bump on his head from where he fell off some rocks he was climbing off of. And he's also covered in poison ivy because when he was playing in the woods, he saw a snake and he started running and ran right through the poison ivy. Listen, in this story, every command that the father gave his son was for the benefit of the boy. 
he, he wanted the boy to have fun and get exercise and see nature and stuff, but he didn't want him to get hurt, so he set up guidelines and he set up boundaries. Now compare that parable to this little parable. This one's called Keeping Daddy Happy. Once upon a time, there was a man who uh, had married a woman, had two children, a boy and a girl, and so they were his stepchildren, and then she passed away, sadly. And so he was this workaholic businessman, and so he didn't have a lot of time or attention to give his kids. And so what he did is he sat his stepkids down and he said, listen, these are the rules. He said, first of all, don't expect me to give you money. When I was a kid, I went and picked up cans and bottles out of the ditch and returned them to the store for the deposits. And that's how I got money. So you can do something like that. He says, he says, on a weeknight when I get home, I expect you guys to have my house shoes by the door and a hot cup of tea ready. And also I want my newspaper by the recliner. When I do get home, when I do get home, you, you can't be noisy playing. You need, to, you need to go upstairs and be quiet in your room and do your homework or go to bed. He said, when, when I'm not home in the evenings before I get home, I don't care if you play outside, but stay on the concrete, stay on the driveway, because I pay a lot of money to our landscaper, and I don't need you guys messing up the lawn. And finally, on Sunday, that's my one day I get to rest. So on Sunday, maybe if you guys could just find a friend's house to go over, to, or maybe you could go to the park or the mall, but just, I need peace and quiet. So in, in, this, in this scenario, the rules that the, that the dad gave his stepchildren were all about him, were all about him. Do you get the difference in focus? Listen, I'm not against kids working to earn money, and I'm not against kids being quiet so I can rest, believe me. I got three kids. But, but his heart was set on himself not on the kids that he was responsible for. And so here's what I'm afraid happens. People, men, you know, in our society or around the world, we assume that we have enough facts to set the, our own boundaries for our lives. We assume that we know enough to set the boundaries. And so we don't really have to listen to the will of the Lord. Okay, we think, well, yeah, he just decided, you know, it's like, I don't know, purple or blue is good and red is bad. It's just totally arbitrary. And so when we, when, we, when we go past the guardrails, we end up in excess and, and in sin and in death. There are loads of examples. There are loads of examples, but, but one I want to talk about is sexual sin. Okay, God, are there any youth? There aren't any youth in here, are there? Anyway, God created sex and he intended for it to be a good thing, but he has very narrow, very narrow ideas about the context in which it's appropriate. It's the relationship between a husband and a wife, period. That's it, it's, it's simple. But you know what, society says, oh, that's an old fashioned rule, we don't need that. And you know, you can just, you can just behave however. And what, what, what we found out the hard way is we discovered that there was the pain of, of our of our souls, you know, the soul ties that are formed with partner after partner after partner, and the soul ties are formed and they're broken and they're formed and they're broken. And we found out, you know, that there, there are even physical things like disease. And we found out that there is the insecurity because my lover isn't in covenant with me and I don't know if she'll stay. And then of course, not to get too far off on this, but you know, then people decided, well, it doesn't even have to be between, an, a, man, between a man and a woman. And, and what we found out that way was that, was that it affects the kids because kids are made to be raised by a mother and a father. There are two genders that are designed to complement and to, and, to, and to complete one another. And so we threw off these restraints that the Lord gave in this one example. And then when you do this, you don't get the results that the creator intended. And, and in so doing, you even erode the fabric of society. So listen, let me be clear. God is the boss, okay? God's, God's the man on the throne. And he has the right to make arbitrary rules. God has the right to tell you to do stuff that you don't understand, and he may not give you an explanation for it, okay? He is God. And I'm afraid that's gonna happen. Sometimes you're gonna be like, I don't know why I'm doing this, Lord. But I believe that, that by and large, if not every time, the, the, the commands that God gives us are, are for our benefit. They're, they're for the benefit of you and the benefit of your neighbor around you, and they're for the benefit of the generations to come. 
There's a reason. There's a reason God said, don't lie, don't commit adultery, don't murder, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, here we go. Parable number four, the trucker under grace, the trucker under grace. Once upon a time, there was a Christian man, good Christian man who drove a big rig. He was a trucker, had a big Jesus sign on his truck. You may have seen these, John 3, 16. And he, he had a big old tractor trailer and it was actually 16 feet tall, which is a big rig from what I understand. One night he was driving down the highway, Highway 55, making his way across country with a load, and he's hungry and he stops at a truck stop. And when he gets there, he starts, uh, he's eating dinner and there's another trucker there making friendly conversation. And, and the trucker says, the other trucker says, hey, see, you got a big old rig there. He says, yeah, it's 16 foot tall. He says, oh yeah. He says, well, down, down Highway 55 a little way, I don't know if you know, there is a bridge that only has a 14 foot clearance. You got a 16 foot truck, that bridge got a 14 foot clearance. You need to take another route. And the first trucker, the, the Christian trucker, he stops eating, he puts down his fork, he wipes his mouth, he says, brother, I am free in Christ. Do not try to impose your legalistic rules and regulations on me. Don't drive a 16-foot truck under a 14-foot bridge, okay? I'm just saying, I don't, let, let's not misinterpret God's intentions when he commands us to do his will. He's not selfish. He's not needy. He's generous and kind, and he cares about you. So here's, one, here's, here's an area I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk about, praise and worship. Praise and worship, okay? In the word, especially the Psalms, we're commanded to praise the Lord. Talk about how good God is. You know, give thanks to him and offer up a sacrifice of worship. And here's the question, how can that be anything but self-serving? Why does the almighty God, need, you know, want us to praise him? Let's think about that. So here's a parable. The rock star and the sickly child. Once upon a time, once upon a time, there was a singer, songwriter who was enormously successful. And at one point, people even said, this guy is bigger than the Beatles. This guy is bigger than Elvis. This guy is bigger than any rock star that's ever been. And people around the world loved his music and the critics all acclaimed him. And that's not easy to do, okay, to get all the critics to like you. And he had loads of money, super successful. And one night he had his greatest concert ever, the finale of his world tour. And afterwards, he went back into his dressing room and, you know, it had been a great night. And his manager comes in and the manager says, hey, he says, there's a fan that, that wants to meet you. There's a fan that wants to come here and meet you. And he says, listen, the rock star says, listen, I've had a really big day and I'm really tired. He's sitting there drinking his bottle of water or whatever. He says, I'm really tired. He says, I don't need any more people to tell me how amazing I am. I am affirmed, okay? I don't need more praise or more worship, the rock star says. He says, so look, look, just tell this guy to go away. I'm, I'm tired. I, you know, see him another time, whatever. And the manager says to the rock star, he says, you don't understand. He says, this, is, this, this fan is a little girl who's been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And her big wish, it may be her last wish, is to get to meet you and talk with you. And it would mean the world to her if she could just come and be in your presence and hear what you have to say and see your face in person. And so the rock star then, even though, it, he, even though he didn't need his ego stroked anymore, he realized it wasn't about him. It was about this little girl and what she needed. And he knew that it would be a blessing to her if she could just come and spend time with him. I know God's not a rock star, but he is pretty amazing. I mean, I'm, I mean, he's not egotistical. He's not, you know, think of your favorite rock star. God is fully aware of how, how powerful and amazing he is. And he doesn't need, honestly, he doesn't need cheering up. Listen, it's amazing because we do see in, the, in Jesus, we see God weep. And we see God touched by human pain, okay? But at the end of the day, it says in his presence is fullness of joy. At his, at his right hand, pleasures forevermore. God is bigger than what happens 
on earth. He has so much joy that all the sorrow of the millennia of humanity is going to be absorbed one day when he wipes away the tears from every eye. Praise and worship, when we come in here, whether it's on Sunday morning or if you're just alone in your car or your house, praise and worship takes our eyes off of the problem and it puts it on the answer. Okay, praise and worship declares to the powers of darkness what the real reality is, not just how big the problem seems to be. We have a privilege of coming before the king of the universe and contemplating his face and being in his presence and hearing what he has to say. So we are blessed. We are encouraged. Let's not get it backwards. Let's not get it backwards. God doesn't need yes men to boost his confidence, but he knows the best thing we can do is to focus on him. You know, for for school, I was looking at a Ruth Bader Ginsburg speech. You might not expect to hear her in a sermon. And she quoted a rabbi because she's Jewish. She quoted a rabbi and the rabbi said something like this. Why does the Almighty need men to praise him? And the rabbi concluded, because when men stop praising the Lord, they start praising each other. I thought that was really interesting. Anyway, it's all about him. It's all about him. But he did it for you. Isn't that crazy? It's all about him. Okay, here we go. We're, we're, we're doing good. Parable number six, the high maintenance wife. Once upon a time, there was a well-to-do businessman who married a high maintenance woman. And this woman expected and required servants to clean her house and cook her food. She expected frequent shopping trips to fancy uh, stores. She expected her husband to give her gifts of jewelry and flowers. She expected to be taken on trips on exotic vacations and also to go see her mother. But most of all, she wanted compliments. She expected her husband to tell her how beautiful she was and how smart she was and wonderful. And so for a while, this went all right. But after a while, the, 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 the husband, it kind of got old and he maybe he'd slipped. He didn't compliment her as much or take her out to eat as much or whatever. And she started getting mad. So she started griping and complaining. And the more she griped and complained, the less he liked her because she, she was entitled. She felt entitled to gifts and praise and service and all this lavish lifestyle. And so finally, at the end of the day, the man said, I've had enough. And he, he, he left her. He divorced her. It's kind of, anyway, that's kind of a bummer. That's kind of, but listen, this is what I want to tell you. God is not your ex-wife or your ex-husband, okay? God is not high maintenance. We are high maintenance. I just, I hope you realize, I realize how high maintenance I am sometimes with the Lord. And, and this, this is why we think, he, I mean, you would never say that, but this is what we, some people think. Some of you don't identify with this, I bet, but some people do. This is what we do. We wake up in the morning and say, okay, wake up in the morning. I'm a Christian and I've got to please the Lord because I don't want to make him mad and I don't want to go to hell. I've got, okay, what do I have to do? I have to, get, I have to do my devo- devotional. I have to read two chapters of the Bible and pray for 20 minutes. I also need to get up and do a good job at work. I need to sign up for the women's fall tea at Encourage Your Church. I need to be patient with my children and my spouse. I need to, uh, I need to report all of my income to the IRS. I need to not watch those traf- trashy TV shows, even though they're hysterical sometimes. Let's see. Oh, I need to pray in the spirit and I need to give thanks at all times in all circumstances and let the praises of God be continually on my lip. And I need to not smoke cigarettes or vape or gossip about my coworkers or fornicate. And if I don't do all these things, God will be, I will be sinning and God will be hurt and angry because he is very sensitive. Look, all that stuff is, is, I think, pretty good stuff, guys. Don't cheat on, please don't cheat on your taxes. Please don't, you know, be unfaithful in your marriage. But listen, listen. When God tells us this stuff, I believe he's, look, he's, he's saying, look, this is the best way. This is the best way to live. Let me give you, a, let me give you a, some advice. I mean, it's a command. It's not just advice, but still, It's like, let me give you some advice. Here's how to live. Here's how you're going to prosper. He did it in the Old Testament. He does it in the New Testament. 
Listen, I'm not trying to say, and I don't want you to think that I'm preaching a man-centered gospel, okay? It's, 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 it's actually the opposite, but, but I believe that God is so unselfish that you could hear the gospel and, and conclude that it's all about you. Graham Cook says the gospel is so good it borders on fantasy. That's, that's kind of a heavy statement, but the gospel is almost too good to believe, almost too good to be true. Let me, t- here's my joke. I told you my parables, here's my joke. You may have heard it before. If you go to the animal shelter and you get a puppy, okay? If you go to the animal shelter and you get a puppy and you take it home and you raise it and you give it food and you give it a place to stay and you love on it, that puppy, that dog, when it grows up, it will look around knowing what you do for it and it will conclude that you are God and he will worship you. That's how dogs are. If you go to an animal shelter and you pick up a kitten and you take it home and give it and give it a, a, a bed and a litter box and food and attention, that cat will grow up and knowing what you do for it, that cat will assume that it is God <laughs> and that you worship it. <laughs> Listen guys, same situation, different interpretation. God, God doesn't give because we are worthy. He gives because he is kind. I'm getting close, getting close here. I want to talk about the prodigal father. But first, I I want to reference, I'm not going to take the time to read it. There's a story in the Gospels, and it talks about, there's a similar story in four four Gospels, and in our brains, we tend to make it into one story. It's about the woman with the alabaster box. But I think if you look carefully, you'll realize it's two or even three incidents in Scripture. So, but throughout these, basically there's a recurring theme. There's a woman who comes into Jesus and she has some kind of ointment or expensive ointment. And, you know, sometimes she breaks the alabaster box or whatever, and she puts it on Jesus. And in some of the cases, well, in every case, somebody's offended. And in some of the cases, people are like, she wasted this money. This was wasteful. This money could have been given to the poor. And Jesus rebukes them. Both, he's like, no, it's good. You know, you'll always have the poor, or she's done this to, uh, to prepare me for my burial or whatever. You can go look these up. And what we see, though, what we see is a lavish, a lavish expression of love because I believe that those women had received, had experienced a lavish, overwhelming, extravagant land love from Jesus. And you know what happens, I believe, when you experience extravagant, lavish love, your response is extravagant and lavish towards the Lord. You break your alabaster box and you pour it out upon him. And so what seems wasteful to one person really isn't wasteful at all. Let's, this is my final, this is the parable. This is the parable, the prodigal son. I bet you've all heard it, but I think I have time to read it real fast. It says, and he said, this is Luke 15, if you want to go there. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided, them to, his, he divided to them his living. And not many days later, the young son gathered everything together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. He was partying, y'all. He partied. And when he had spent everything, there came a great famine in that land and he began to be in need. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. It's a Jewish boy feeding pigs, y'all. And he would have liked to fill his stomach with the husks that the pigs ate. That he was in such bad shape. The pig, he, man, this pig slop looks good. But no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare? And I'm starving. I will get up and go to my father and will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he got up and went to his father. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and slaughter it and let's eat and have a party, celebrate. Here's where it gets interesting. This is what I want to focus on. 
And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and got close to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of his servants and asked what that was all about. And he said, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. And he, and he answered his father, look, I've served you for many years. And I had never disobeyed one of your orders. And yet you never gave me a, even a goat, even a cabrito. Okay, you never gave me a, a young goat so that I could have a party with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, not my brother, as soon as this son of yours comes who has devoured your living with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him. And the father says to him, son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. He says it was right for us to, to party and celebrate because this brother of yours, your brother, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. This is a great story. This is possibly the number one hit of all Jesus' parables. How many sermons over in the last 2,000 years have been based on the parable of the prodigal son? How many people got saved because they heard that story and they said, yes, that is me. I'm the prodigal son. I ran off. But today, I'm not really here to focus mainly on that guy. I'm here to focus on the number one son, Mr. Responsibility and Faithfulness. See, this parable is a double barrel shotgun, and I'm, I'm shooting out of this second barrel here. Do you know if you look up the word prodigal in the dictionary, it might not mean what you think it means, because over time, it's kind of taken on this baggage of a prodigal is someone who runs from God. A prodigal is someone who is rebellious and off doing their own thing. But you know what? If you look up the word prodigal in the dictionary, you're going to see a definition that says wasteful. It means wasteful. It has to do with spending your money and, anyway, not using it wisely. You might be interested in knowing that if you look at the Greek, the original text of the New Testament, the word prodigal son is not there. The, the term prodigal son was added in like the fourth century, maybe, when they were working on the Vulgate, of the Vulgate a Latin translation of the Bible. So one of the translators, maybe Jerome, if you know who that is, he thought, oh, I'm going to put headings in here. And oh, this little parable, I'm going to put the heading and I'm going to call it mm, the prodigal son. And that's the first time it shows up in, in the textual history of the Bible. And so if that's being the case, then I feel, I feel freedom to, to be critical of it. I don't think the prodigal son is the best, is the best, uh, is the best title. I think a better title would be the prodigal father. Okay, now the father in the story isn't rebellious, but you know what he is? He's lavish in the love and in the grace that he gives to his sons. And when he gives extravagant and lavish grace to the younger son who ran off and did this stuff, the older son is, is offended at the waste. This should have been given to the poor. No, you know, it's the same idea. And the truth is that the father loves both sons and he wants both sons in the house fellowshipping. The one that was off doing his own thing, being rebellious, and also the one that has been slaving faithfully year after year. He wants to be in fellowship with both. We sing about the reckless love of God, the reckless love of God. Guys, God isn't reckless like careless and irresponsible, it's, that's poetry. That means it feels that way. God, why do you love people that don't deserve it? God, if I were you, I would not love that person. You're being reckless. And yet, yet we see this extravagant love that the father pours out on the younger son and on the older son. So whether or not it's prodigality, wastefulness, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. Depends on your point of view. Let me say one other thing before I wrap up. Uh, there's another word that resembles prodigal, and it's the word prodigy. Now, usually I think when we hear prodigy, we think of a five-year-old who can play Mozart on the piano or play the violin or something really amazing. But you know what prodigy means? It doesn't mean very talented young ch child. 
It doesn't mean that. If you look it up, the original meaning means prophetic sign. Look it up. It means prophetic sign. And so what it was, when people saw that kid who could, who could uh, play violin or piano, they think, wow, that's, that's a miracle. That's, that's an amazing sign and a wonder. And that's where we get that. But this is what I want to suggest to you. When we receive the Father's prodigal love, his lavish, extravagant love, and we turn around and we pour it out on others and pour out the worship, it becomes a sign. It becomes a prophetic sign that the world sees. It's a prodigy. It's a sign. It's a miracle. Because he's a prodigal father. He gives, he gives, and he gives. So to wrap, start wrapping up here, I was talking to my wife, and she's very practical. She, she wants to know after a sermon, what is the practical application of this sermon? Benjamin, what can people do? And really, I don't know what to tell you to do. I'm just hoping to change your mindset. I'm hoping to give you a different perspective about why the Lord has commanded you to do whatever it is that he's commanded you, whether it's in his word or if it's to you specifically, his call for your life. And the question is, how do you perceive the Father? Is he self-serving or is he selfless? You know, back in the Garden of Eden, everything was great until the snake came along. There was one tree and, the, and God said, listen, this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat, eat, don't eat from it. Okay, my personal opinion is that he only wants Adam and Eve to know good, not good and evil. That's what I think. And then Satan comes along, the snake comes along, and what does he say? He says, he says, God is holding out on you. When you eat the fruit, God knows that you will be like him, knowing good from evil. So in essence, he says, God is insecure and he's watching out for his own interests. And that is why he has commanded you not to eat this forbidden fruit. Because he does not want you to have the same advantage he has. And sadly, Adam and Eve fell for it. Adam and Eve fell for it. And people still, still fall for it today. God speaks out of love and concern and kindness. And we question the heart behind it and decide we don't have to do it. Listen, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that there won't be uh, hard times and trials in life. I'm not saying life won't be difficult. But I think that if we really get this revela the revelation, and I'm not there yet, but that, that what God says is, is out of love, what he commands is for, is for our good. When we understand that the key to blessing is obedience, the key to blessing is obedience, I think that we will go from from striving not to sin to running after God's blessing. Like a kid in a candy store that says, I'm gonna get all that I can. Because God said, he said, I set before you life and death, blessing and curse. And, and I think our attitude will become, I am gonna go for everything I can. I am gonna choose life. I'm gonna choose life. So I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping this up here if you guys wanna start playing. But uh, Listen, many people can identify with a prodigal son. They can think back to the day they got saved and they realize they were running from the Lord. And that story really speaks to them. But you know what? There's other people who don't really feel that way because they, got, they were, became a Christian when they were five years old or whatever, and they were raised in church. And maybe they've never walked away from the Lord or maybe they've just been a Christian for so long, it feels like they've, they've never walked away from the Lord. They've always faithfully served him, always come to church, always done that. These are firstborns. Thank God for firstborns. We need people who are faithful and consistent and responsible. But in this story, in the story of the prodigal son, the older son had let bitterness creep in and resentment. He said, all these years, Father, I have been slaving for you. And I have never once transgressed one of your commands. If you feel like a firstborn son, if you identify with a firstborn son to some degree or another, this is what I believe the, the word of the Lord is for you today. Everything I have is yours. That's what the father said to the older son. He says, everything I have is yours. He says, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours.
if you would stand up, uh, if we have the, the ministry team, we could come forward. I pray today, I pray today that we would, if, if need be, that we would get a new revelation of the heart of God. We, we would understand, we would experience, I pray that we would all experience uh, the lavish, extravagant, prodigal love of the Father. Because he loves, he loves the son that ran off and rebelled and did his own thing. And he loves the firstborn, responsible, faithful son who is here all these years, all these years serving him. Because uh, he's a good God. He's a good God. And what he says, I believe he says for our benefit. So I'm going to pray. Father God, I thank you for your love for a prodigal like me. How you forgive us, God, when we have sinned and we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. But I also thank you, Father, that when we feel like we've been serving you a long time and we've been doing pretty good and, and we're, when we're upset or we're jealous or we, we question your motives, God, or we question your goodness, that you're a God who invites us in to sit at the table. And you remind us that everything we have is yours. And I thank you, God, that you are with us always. We are always with you. So I pray today, God, that we would take, that we would first of all receive of your extravagant love, how you forgive us and save us. And I pray that we would turn around and we would take our alabaster box and we would break it at your feet or break it and pour it over your head, God. And people will say, that is so wasteful. Why are you doing that? Why do you serve the Lord? Why do you serve the Lord like that? And that we would be like, I can't help it. I can't help it because he just loves me so, so much. So, Lord God, I pray bless every person today, and I thank you. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.